Guys, welcome back to the channel. On this episode, we are going to continue to work on our intercooler and intake tube in here. So on the last episode, you saw us make that carbon fiber sleeve for the uh, intake tube. On this episode, I'm gonna show you how this intercooler top got made. And then basically what we've got going on here with our intercooler uh, tube to the throttle body. So we got some pretty sweet uh, machining, some homebrew anodizing that we did in this episode, which I can show you how we did it. Uh, and uh, I'll show you the state that it's in now. So um, stay tuned, let's go through the process. Okay guys, so we got everything plasma cut out and we just, just uh, eighth inch aluminum, getting it bent up. And we're gonna go ahead and get that welded onto our intercooler. Okay, so I have the intercooler out of the truck. I got my part here and everything's gonna fit up okay. So what I'm gonna do next, I'm gonna prep this uh, intercooler face here, get it cleaned off, uh, all the contaminants out of it, and then uh, let's weld it up. So guys, you can see me here sort of tacking this thing up and I actually have to go back and grind a little bit of it down. What this, what I found with this part is that there's a lot of contamination in those intercoolers from the brazing process and they take a little bit of care to get right. So um, still working on figuring out how to get that dialed in perfectly, but uh, the end result was pretty good. I was happy with how it finally welded up just took a little bit of practice and I had to cook a little bit of the, the debris out of it uh, in order to get a decent bead, but the end result is good enough. All right guys, so this is what we're gonna make up next. I have a billet intake flange. This is for the carbon fiber part and we have it all programmed up in Fusion. So now I'm gonna head over to my buddy Jason's house and we're gonna go ahead and get this thing machined up and uh, see how it goes. So like I mentioned guys, my buddy Jason uh, was helping me machine this part. He owns Schmuck Built uh, Performance if you guys haven't seen it, but he just got this new Sweet Haas VF2. Um, and it is great. Um, you saw there the automatic tool setter, and um, we've been working on some little projects and stuff together, and he's been helping me out uh, getting some machine work done. But this was the first part that we ran on this machine uh, in aluminum, so some of the tool selection and stuff, we were sort of working through uh, speeds and feeds, but overall I'm pretty happy with how everything turned out. and. Um, you know, the tools that we selected seem to do a good job and leave a good finish.
All right, so you guys saw how the thing got machined. It went pretty well. Um, I didn't get a lot of chance to do any commentary and stuff during the uh, actual machining of it because I was trying to get in and out for Jason because he came in after work. But you can see surface finish looks nice. We did not ball mill this uh, step. Uh, we went through the process of roughing it in. I kind of like the look of it uh, the way it is. So um, we're going to leave it like that. We did have a little bit of excitement when we were uh, machining the inside pocket out. Um, when we were doing that, obviously it relieves a lot of the strength of the part between the vices. And uh, we were paying close attention to it because we knew it was a concern, but uh, right at the end when it was going on the roughing pass of this outside, uh, the part just walked out of the vise slightly and we stopped it and caught it and uh, just re-indicated everything back in, took a much lighter cut, and then we also got some uh, steel and put it between the inside. That's why this inside piece does not have a finishing pass on it, but you're never gonna see it, and only air flows through there, so it's fine. So I did go ahead and uh, just shove this thing on. It's just roughed in. I didn't belt sand the, the part to get it fitted up perfectly, um, but it does fit, it's snug, so I'm going to have to relieve a little bit of the uh, pressure or the uh, extra material on it to, you know, get a better gap. Uh, you want a little bit of a gap, uh, sort of a slip fit for the adhesion. Uh, so you have a good thickness of epoxy in there when you bond this, but it's pretty good. So I think the next steps that we're gonna do now, I'm gonna take this flange back out of here um, and we are going to pull the intercooler out of the truck. We're going to take this bolt pattern and transfer it onto the intercooler and then we're gonna drill all the holes for the mounting hardware on here. Um, I'm not sure yet if I want to tap the intercooler directly or if I want to put a backup ring, a steel backup ring inside of the intercooler and then thread into steel. I'm leaning that direction to be honest with you. So I'm gonna go ahead, uh, pull this out and let's get started. Okay, so you guys saw the flange and how that was machined. So that is going to mount onto this surface and it's held on with 25 uh, socket head cap screw bolts. And uh, they're little tiny M5 bolts and I did that on purpose because I want a nice tight gasket seal along this. So I don't want a lot of spacing in between each bolt. Now, this material is eighth inch aluminum if you remember from the episode when we made this cap. So theoretically, I could thread into this and um, pressure wise and bolt strength wise, I'm not gonna have any issues. Uh, if you do the calculations, there is more than enough strength in this aluminum uh, material, even at you know four threads deep or three and a half threads deep to support 50 pounds of boost um, at 25 di you know, different screws. Now, the problem has very little to do with the stress. It has more to do with, um, you know, idiots, me, uh, tightening the bolts down and the extremely low torque values that you would need to use for this aluminum. So there's a high probability that um, I could strip the threads out or I could do something like that. So not ideal. So what I did was I machined, not machined, but plasma cut out this piece. And this piece goes inside of here. And if you look, it just, fits in, it's hard to do with the camera, fits in here and I can put it up behind there. So this piece is steel. It's light, it's only uh, eighth inch thick, I don't know, probably weighs about a quarter pound. Um, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna transfer that whole pattern onto this material and this is going to be my backup ring. And that way we don't have any nuts or anything inside of the intercooler or the intake path where you know, you could have a, a nut or something like that back off and go into the engine and wreck what will eventually probably be a $20,000 race engine. So we don't want to do that. So I'm going to go ahead, go get the intake uh, flange. We're going to transfer the bolt pattern on here, do a lot of drilling and a lot of tapping. So let's get started. Okay guys, so I got the uh, back of ring all threaded up and you can see here, everything fits pretty good. So 
That is done. So that is going to fit inside of there and squeeze that aluminum intercooler tight, which is good. That'll give good compression on the gasket. Bolt spacing is nice and tight, so there won't be any deflection between the bolts. So pretty good. So uh, what we gotta do next, we gotta do the same process, except without the tapping uh, on the inter intercooler. So I need to rip that out. I need to tape off all of the fins so I don't have you know, little bits of aluminum dripping down inside the intercooler full like a Rob Dom or something. Uh, so next we're gonna get that off, transfer the bolt pattern again off of this, onto that, and then drill it out. Okay, so we got her all drilled out here and I got all the inside deburred, which I did not think about until I drilled it and realized I had all these burrs in here and how to get them out. So used just a razor blade to cut them and then took a file, uh, actually a chain saw sharpening file and sort of reamed the holes out and got it nice and smooth the inside. Uh, I did masking tape everything off ahead of time, shot back that all out so it's nice and clean again and then ripped the tape out so we're good to go. So go ahead and uh, let's bolt the ring in. Okay, so that's all hooked up. Got the intercooler placed back in here. I need to hook the turbos back up, but uh, it looks pretty good. So everything pulled flat. There was a little bit of bow in this intercooler plate, but all these fasteners drew everything nice and tight to the uh, flange here. So the next step, I need to get the uh, tube. We're gonna take that tube and I'm gonna surface the inside of it sort of with like a flap disc. It's one of those rotary flap discs put on the end of a die grinder. And I'm just gonna keep working that carbon just till I have a nice slip fit here. So we're not gonna take off a lot because it does fit over top now, it's just a little snug. So maybe take off like five, 10 thousandths all the way around, get that nice and smooth till it slides on here, then I'll be happy with that. Once that is sort of fit where I want it, we're gonna take it and then put it on a belt sander and flush the whole face off so that this edge here indexes nice and tight against the bottom of the carbon. Once that is done, it's time to work on this end and get the carbon cut to the right length and, and shaved just the way we want and get that tube fit. So it's looking pretty good. Let's keep on working. Okay, so I got these all sandblasted and I'm gonna take them in here, they're still dirty. Um, take them in and get them in a degreaser bath. We're gonna use some simple green uh, straight cut and scrub these up and I'll put some gloves on so I get everything clean. Um, and then uh, once these are all simple green, they're gonna go into a lye bath um, to etch the aluminum and then that should get it ready for anodize. So I'm gonna go in and scrub these up. Okay, so here we have our two baths. We have a smut bath, which is 2% lye. Then I have a bath, which is our acid. This is our uh, sodium bisulfate. This is like basically pool uh, acid. Um, so I use this instead of battery acid because one, it's a little bit safer. Two, it's cheap. And you know, it works just as good in all my testing so far. So what I'm gonna do now, I have this part over here, um, all set up with the wire on it. I'm gonna dip that into the lye bath and I'm gonna leave it in there for about three minutes. After it comes out, I'm gonna neutralize it with some baking soda solution. This is just baking soda and water. And then once it's done with that, I will rinse it off with just distilled water uh, and get it good and clean. Then I'll uh, dip it in 
this here. This is the acid bath and we'll get the power supply hooked up to it and then we'll put our voltage to it. So once we get this all set up, um, I'll go through how the voltage is calculated. Okay, so you can see we have our live bath cooking here. You can see all that stuff coming off of there. That is all organics and probably aluminum oxide from the blasting grit coming out of the surface of the aluminum. So the lye's eating uh, the aluminum, like a sacrificial layer of the aluminum, and then the process is getting it really clean and stripping everything off. And you can see some of the trash there floating around. I think that was a little bit of a paper towel <laughs> or something like that, um, just from one of my tests. So, <clears throat> Overall, everything is going pretty good. Uh, once this is done cooking, I'll give it another couple of minutes here. And then once this is done cooking, um, we will do all the cleaning of it and then get it in our bath here. Um, one thing, if you're doing this at home, if you actually want like a good surface finish and you're not gonna be painting these afterwards, you don't want it touching the side of the bucket. Um, you don't want anything happening in here that you know would cause anything to touch. Uh, the surfaces that you are trying to get a nice cosmetic finish on. Uh, this part here, since it's blasted and it's going to be painted, I'm not super worried about, you know, uneven surface finish. But we do need to make sure that we don't touch any of these um, anodes, I guess you'd call those. Those are the anodes or cathodes? One of, one or the other. Um, so we just need to make sure that we don't touch them because they'll short the, the whole thing out and they'll stop working. So... I think this is just about done. I'm gonna pull it out and neutralize it. Okay, so the parts in the bath, it's not touching the sides and it's not touching the uh, plates in there. Right now, uh, I've calculated this to be about 100 square inches of surface area using Fusion. And uh, so that's gonna work out. If you use the 720 rule, which is pretty common with anodizing, if you're not familiar with it, look it up. Um, it comes out to about five amps um, with a six amp, uh, current density so um, that should be pretty good so we're gonna leave that um, the way it is now and then we're gonna let this uh, go ahead and cook for about two hours an hour uh, yeah 120 minutes two hours so we'll come back and see how it looks okay so we're about an hour and 15 minutes in I pulled the part out real quick and took a look at it, it is taking on a nice tint to indicate that it is it's like a slightly 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 yellow tint indicating to me that uh, it's taking the anodizing well, so that's good. Just gonna let that go. In the meantime, I have a bucket over here. Um, this is distilled water with like four or five containers of writ dye in it. Um, I am gonna dye this part just to, for practice. And it helps show where the anodizing was taken, like good and where it wasn't, um, which is important for us since we're worried about the uh, electrical conductivity. This is uh, three containers of black dye and one container of blue dye. I would not use this in a automotive application, um, but it was cheap and I was just trying to test the process. So one thing you need to know about these Brit dyes is they're not color fast. So over time, if I were to use this, it'd probably turn into a purple uh, with UV light over time. But like I said, we're only using this to indicate where the anodized took. We're going to Cerakote it after we dye it, so there's no big deal. In the meantime, what I need to do is I got uh, one of these submergence heaters here and uh, I'm gonna stick it in this and get this up to 140 degrees Fahrenheit so that when we're done anodizing, we can pull that part out and uh, neutralize it. And then we're gonna dip it in here for probably about 20 minutes and dye it and see how it turns out. Okay guys, so there you go. I got a nice part anodized, it's been in there an hour and a half. You can see it sort of took a little bit of yellow tint. That might be because I'm using uh, the pull acid rather than the battery acid, but it's gonna do the trick. So I'm gonna hurry up and get this in the dye because you don't want it to dry. Um, it's almost up to, I'm shooting for 60 degrees Celsius, which would be about 140 Fahrenheit. And uh, I'm gonna keep this part wet with this sealed water. I've already rinsed it off with a baking soda solution. And then uh, we're gonna dye it for about 25 minutes and see how it looks. Okay, so this part's been in here for about 10 minutes now. You can see it took a real good coat so I'm happy with the color. Um, it's definitely coming out nice and black. So I need to leave that in there, keep it wet because you don't want it to dry out. And I need this uh, ceiling bucket to heat up to basically boiling temp. And then we'll rinse that part off uh, to get all the excess dye off with distilled water. Stick it in there and then it should be done. Well, done anodizing. We'll still need to cerakote it, but that'll come later. So let's see what happens. 
Okay, guys, I'm not going to lie. That did not come out too bad at all. Um, nice satin finish. You can see a little bit of moisture in the holes there, but it is an even finish all the way around. I just wiped it down with WD-40, so you, if you're seeing any residual, that's what it is. But nice and satin, pretty even. I'm pretty happy with that. So I have the tube in right now. I did notice on this guy the weld was slightly discolored compared to the rest of the part. So I'm not sure if it's a different alloy, which probably is. Um, and that's causing the issue or what. So we'll see how it takes color. The part is anodizing fine, but I'm not sure. We'll have to see how it, how it takes color. So we'll find out in a minute. All right, guys. So there she is. I just have it sitting in there with the clamps, but you can sort of see how everything looks. Really happy with the way this is looking. Uh, I did sit the carbon fiber valve covers in there just for the sake of seeing how things are turning out. That's going to end it for this episode. Um, on the next episode, we're going to get this thing bonded together, and I am going to Cerakote these parts. The bottom came out great. Um, really happy with that. What I didn't realize at the time is the alloy that I used to um, weld the top uh, doesn't take anodizing very well. It anodizes, but it doesn't color match to the other materials. So what I'm going to need to do is uh, Cerakote it all and then bond everything, and it's going to look great. But I am really happy with how that is looking. Looks pretty sick. So, yeah, I think we're going to call this one an episode. Hope you guys like it. I'm happy to uh, get this anodizing in now and uh, be able to do some stuff like this. I'm super tickled pink about the shape of everything and the color. Um, obviously, this needs bolted in, but it looks good. So, until next time, appreciate it. Like and subscribe. Um, share with all your friends. See you guys.